Good morning. Good morning. It is a privilege and an anticipated blessing to study God's Word with you this morning. Just as the word Amen is the last word in a prayer, so also is Jesus' last message to the seventh church in Revelation 3. His last appeal to the human race through that seventh church. Many people believe that Laodicea is a bad name because it talks about judgment. But in order to understand Laodicea, and especially the word judgment, we need to understand that the word judgment can be used two different ways. In the scripture, the word judgment can be used as condemnation or punishment to the unbeliever. But it can also be used as justice and reward to the believer. How we choose to accept God's word depends on how the word judgment will be applied to each of our lives. The Odyssey is also very important because two major events take place during the historical period of time of Laodicea. The first, obviously, is the vindication of God's people or judgment for the unbeliever. But during that same historical period of time, a major event is going to take place, and that is the vindication of God's people or God's great law of love. Specifically, when the sanctuary in heaven is cleansed by the mediatorial high priest. If you had cancer in your body, would you want to know about it? <laughs> Who would you want to hear this news from? The person in charge of the lab that did the lab work on you a few days ago and sent you an email on it? Or would you prefer to get the news from the top authority in cancer study, in detecting it, and then surgically removing it? In Revelation 3, 14, Jesus, the surgeon, uses three words to describe the spiritual condition of his church. The first word that he uses is hot. From a spiritual standpoint, what Jesus is saying is that if you surrender yourself to me, then I will overtake your body mentally and physically, and you will produce spiritually hot words. Recorded in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, a passage that all of you are familiar with. But the fruit of the Spirit or the work of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and grace. That would make Jesus very happy. Then Jesus says of Laodicea, uses a very interesting word. He says, I wish you were hot. <laughs> or at least cold. Why would Jesus say that? Because he says that if you get so cold that you can't stand it anymore and you realize that your life is at stake, you'll come in to me and I will make you spiritually hot. But then Jesus says something amazing. The problem that I have with you, Lady Lucia, is that you're neither hot or cold. Now some people misinterpret that. They say, well, Laodicea used to be hot, and then she became cold, and now she's just kind of wandered into the oneness. Um, I doesn't teach that. Jesus says, Laodicea has never been hot. Laodicea has never been cold. Laodicea has always been lukewarm. In the English language, we have a word that describes lukewarm. It's called legalism. But in the Bible times, when the New Testament was written, there was no word in the Greek language for lukewarmness. So God inspired the writers to use the word works of the law. Paul uses that word 
in Romans 9, verses 30, 31, and 32, when he says, the converts to Christianity from the Gentile world pursued righteousness through faith, and they experienced it. The Jews, unfortunately, pursued righteousness by the works of the law, and they still have an experience of righteousness. Paul says the same thing to the Philippians in Philippians 7, chapter 3, verse 7, 8, and 9. He said, it is impossible to experience righteousness through the pursuit of the works of the law. In Revelation 3.16, Jesus says to Laodicea, because you are neither hot or cold or lukewarm, I feel, or I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Some people get the idea from that that God has given up on Laodicea. And so they're looking for an eighth church, which the Bible doesn't talk about. Some of them say, we need to go back to the sixth church, Philadelphia. But they haven't read Revelation 3, 7, and 8, which says Jesus closed the door to Philadelphia. And it's impossible to get into Philadelphia again. Because Jesus says, no one will ever be able to open that door. Which means that Jesus is going to finish his work to Laodicea. Amen. It's important for us to understand what the word spew means. In the original language of the New Testament, Jesus says, Melose emesai. The word emesai in English is E N E T I C, emetic. It means vomit. <laughs> Say, is in the second person pronoun. But the key word is melo, M-E-L-L-O. -O, which means, I am about to do something. That same word melo is used in Revelation 10.4, where John the Revelator says, I am about to write something regarding the seven thunders, but he never does. That's why he uses the word M-E-L-L-O. -L -L -O. I'm about to write something, but I never do. I'm not going to. So. In John 4, 47, we learn about a little boy that was very, very, very sick. At the point of dying. About to die. But he doesn't die. Why? Because Jesus comes and heals him. Amazingly, there's one translation in the English language that correctly translates melo se emesai. Believe it or not, it's the NIV. The New International Version. And it says, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. In today's modern language, we would say, you make me so sick of my stomach that I feel like throwing up. That's Jesus speaking to us. Which means that we are giving him a clinical case of nausea. <laughs> I believe that most Christians are sincere. But sincerity doesn't help anyone. It doesn't diagnose the issue. The issue is with us sincere Christians is that we do not understand our heart condition. God has been trying to communicate to us that to us since the Old Testament in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is a deceitful thing and desperately, I know the word is wicked, but in the original language it means incurable. Who can know it? And our problem is that we think we know our hearts. In Revelation 3, 17, Jesus says something amazing to us. Let me read it to you. Because you say, I am rich 
and have become wealthy and have need of nothing? I personally have never heard a Christian say audibly, I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. I have never heard a Christian audibly say such a thing. Why is Jesus saying this? Because he says, I know your heart. And in your heart, you believe that you are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. I don't believe any Christian will ever say that. But they don't have to. Because the true witness is saying to us right here in verse 17, I am telling you what your condition is. I am the world expert in reading conditions. And I am telling you what's happening inside of you. In other words, you are the most conspicuously wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked group of people that I have ever worked with. <laughs> I'm just reading to you. Why is this the case? Because we have been deceived into focusing on signs. What, is that? what do I mean by signs? Well, every time that there's a terrorist act or an incredible, destructive event in nature, we associate that Jesus is coming soon. But a sign is not what triggers or causes Jesus' second coming. What Jesus is saying here is that I need for you to experience a heart relationship with me that will trigger my second coming. So because we are focused on signs and we know all the signs, we think we're ready for graduation. But in point of fact, we are in kindergarten and not qualified to be advanced to first grade. The question is, will we accept the remedy of the true witness? That's the issue. And so the true witness now says in verse 18, aren't you glad that the Laodicean message doesn't end with verse 17? I am. Because here is the one that's focused on solutions. Verse 18. The first thing that we need is gold tried in the fire. What does that mean? Let's turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. You there, say ready. Let me read three verses to you, beginning with verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though... Now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Seven. That the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The sentence continues in verse 8. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So, the gold is something that has been tested. Some of you have been tested. In that testing process, some of you may have said, where is God? Or maybe God has abandoned me. God never abandons the believer. God doesn't even abandon the non-believer. Another scripture that deals with the testing and how we experience it or go through it. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. 1 John chapter 5, from the right of Peter. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5.
Beginning with verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has, past tense, overcome the world. Our faith. Verse 5. And who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So when we are tested, if we understand this and actually believe it, what should we be focused on during these times? It is a blessing. It is God burning out that dross in us, the aloes, so that the goal will be perfect and you will be the richest human being on planet Earth until Jesus comes. Do you like that? Must be. The second item that Jesus considers the remedy are white garments. What is the purpose of white garments? To cover our nakedness. Let me ask you something. This may be embarrassing. Have you ever been in front of a group of people like I am before you? You ladies? Have you come from the ladies' room and your blouse was not properly tucked in or your slip was showing? Men, have you come from the men's room and had not properly, or at all, zipped up one of the garments that you're wearing? Did I take this a little further? Yes. <laughs> have you ever had something hanging from your nose that you were not aware of? And you were in front of people. What was your reaction when you looked at yourself in the mirror? Shocked. Were you embarrassed? Yes. Yeah, shocked. That, Jesus says, is the way that we look to the universe. <laughs> we lay this here. But there's a spiritual meaning here also. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, The carnal mind is enmity against God and not subject to the law of God. And even if it tries, it cannot be. Do you know what the word enmity means? It means the human capacity to hate something so much that you're ready to go to war and kill that other person. It also means your capacity to murder someone. Take someone's life. How does this apply to us in a spiritual sense? In Matthew 25, verses 41 to 45, Jesus says in a parable, When you saw someone indeed hungry, thirsty, naked, in jail, and you did not minister to that person's needs, you actually weren't ministering to me. Paul says in Romans 3.19, all the world stands guilty before God. What is he talking about? Was Jesus the Lamb of God? Yes. When did he make a commitment to offer himself as the Lamb of God? Revelation 13, verse 8. Mm -hmm. Slain since when? From the foundation of the world. Which means that each one of us individually participated in the crucifixion of Christ. We have that capacity through enmity. So, the purpose of the white garments is to symbolically illustrate to us the cure that the physician has for each one of us. Is that scriptural? In Romans 8, verse 4, Paul 
records an incredible statement. And he uses a very specific word to record this concept. In the English language, we have two words that are very important, righteousness and justification. But in the original language of the New Testament, there are nine words for the usage of the words righteousness and justification in English. Paul is using in Romans 8, 4, one of those nine words. And he says, so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That word in the original language of the New Testament is speaking of our fitness, the imparted righteousness that Christ is prepared to what? Give us. That same word appears in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. When John the Revelator says, It is time to rejoice because the bride has finally chosen to make herself ready. And the evidence of that is that a robe of righteousness has been given to her and she has not rejected it. And that robe of righteousness represents the righteous acts of the saints. Our fitness for heaven. So the one that prepared that robe of righteousness is the one through the Holy Spirit that produces those good works. Do you like that arrangement? So when Jesus says in Luke 23, 34, as he's being crucified, Father, forgive them, they have no clue what they're doing. That applies to you. The enmity in us says that had we been there, we would have participated in the crucifixion of Jesus. And until you and I recognize our capacity of evil, of enmity toward a fellow man and to Christ, we will not be receptive to experience that robe of righteousness that he's most anxious to put on us, which fits us for eternity. One of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church wrote a profound statement regarding this in Christ's Object Lessons, page 312. I will read it to you word for word. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes one with His mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to Him. We live His life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of His righteousness. End quote. Christ's object lessons, page 312. The third item that Jesus has as a remedy for our condition that causes him nausea is the eyesight. In Proverbs, Twenty twenty-seven. the inspired writer says, Man's conscience is the lamp of the eternal, flashing into his inmost soul. So the eye set is given to us so that we will understand and appreciate the Word of God, which gives us what? Direction in how to live every aspect of our life. I asked in Sabbath school, are you impressed with the fact that the Godhead created everything from nothing in six literal days? And you said, yeah. It is this same power that is asking us to put on these three different remedies so that we can cure Jesus of his nausea towards us. This is the best part of the Christian experience. 
Because as we are enlightened through the Word of God about our condition, we will rejoice in that robe of righteousness that He has placed over us. And we will also rejoice as our minds are illumined to what He wants to complete in us and save us to the uttermost. This is how overcoming takes place. Have you heard that expression? Save to the other one.